I'm thrilled to kick off this 2020 series today with a lecture by someone whom The Economist has called a global cybersecurity guru. Uh, Bruce Schneier is the author of more than a dozen books. A couple are available at the back there, including the optimistically titled Click Here to Kill Everybody, one of my favorites, um, along with hundreds of articles, essays, and academic papers. I had the pleasure of getting to know Bruce a little bit when we were both fellows at the Kennedy School a few years ago, and we did some work on making democracy harder to hack, but election security is just one of his many interests and specialties, as you'll hear. In short, Bruce is one of the most influential people today in tech. His newsletter Letter Cryptogram, which I'd encourage you to check out, and his brilliant blog, Schneier on Security, are read by more than a quarter million people regularly. Aside from his research and advocacy, Bruce is also a fellow and lecturer at Harvard and a board member of the Electronic Frontiers Foundation. And Von Welch, director of CACR, who couldn't unfortunately be here today due to a travel conflict, wanted me to mention that our next speaker in this series is Ava Galperin, who's the director of cybersecurity at EFF, coming up on February 13th. Today, Bruce will be presenting some of his current work on securing a world of physically capable computers, which relates to the Ostrom tradition of researching how to build trust across distributed systems. As Lynn said, trust is the most important resource, but it's also one in pretty short supply these days, including in the Internet of Things context. So let's see what we can do about that. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bruce Schneier to IU. Thank you, and, and, and thanks for having me. I think this is an important thing to talk about at this time. And I want to start by sort of giving you a way of thinking in that we're creating a world where everything is a computer. Right? This is actually not a phone. This is a small, portable computer that just happens to make phone calls. And very similarly, your refrigerator is a computer that keeps things cold. And your microwave oven is a computer that makes things hot. And an ATM machine is a computer with money inside. Your car used to be this uh, electromechanical device, then it had some computers in it, and now it is basically a computer with four wheels and an engine. Or if you really study uh, automotive design, it is a 100 plus computer distributed system with four wheels and an engine. And, and this is true throughout our lives from the smallest to a power plant to the power grid. And a power plant's a computer that produces energy. It's more than the internet. It's more than the internet of things. It's this immersive world where everything around us is computerized and connected. And it, it means a couple of things to my world of internet security. It means that internet security becomes everything security. And it means that the lessons from internet security from the past few decades become broadly applicable to everything everywhere. So let me start with six lessons of computer security from my world. And when you hear them, think about them applying to everything. Uh, the first is that most computers, uh, most software is poorly written and insecure. So that's a basic truism. And it's fundamentally economic. We don't want to pay for quality software. With notable exceptions like the space shuttle, software tends to be lousy. There's a joke about restaurants, right? good, fast, cheap, pick any two. It's basically true. It's true with software as well. And we in the market have generally prioritized speed, time to market, and price over quality. I guess really speed, price, and features over quality. And, and quality suffers th uh, throughout the board. Now, you know this uh, because of all the security updates you get, depending on you know, what operating system you use. And this means some important things for, for security. So poor software is full of bugs. How many, we don't know, but thousands, tens of thousands in major pieces of software. Most of them don't matter. Most of them you never encounter, or they're recoverable from. So poor software is full of bugs. Some of those bugs are also vulnerabilities. By with, and that I mean that they enable someone to do something they shouldn't be able to do. 
some of those vulnerabilities are exploitable, meaning you can actually use them to do that bad thing. And some of those are exploited, meaning someone is using them. So modern software is full of vulnerabilities. Second reason is that the internet was never designed with security in mind. Now that seems absolutely crazy when I say it today. But if you think back to the late 70s and early 80s, there were two things true about the internet. One, it wasn't used for anything important ever by anybody. And two, you had to be a member of an accredited research institution to get access to it in the first place. And for those two reasons, the designers of the internet made a conscious decision to ignore security in the core internet protocols. Basically the idea was, internet's just gonna be what it is. If you want security, put it in your application. Right? Move it out to the endpoints. Right? So you could build a secure message program on top of the internet, but you'd be in charge of the security. The internet won't provide anybody. You can build a reliable system but you have to deal with an unreliable internet. And we are still living with the effects of that decision today. In the domain name system, internet routing, packet security, email addresses, we are still trying to retrofit those old insecure protocols. In some cases, we've designed secure versions in like the mid 90s, and we are fighting uh, a first mover problem to getting it implemented. Like getting it switched over. So that's still a problem. It will be for a while. The third reason computers are insecure is that they're extensible. An extensible system basically means anything can be used against you. And extensibility is a property that computers have that's not talked a lot about in this, these words. But I think it's important for us to understand. Basically, it means you can't constrain the functionality of a computer because it runs software. When I was a kid, I had a telephone at home. Big black thing, attached to the wall with a cord. You've probably seen it in movies. A great device, and no matter how hard you tried, it couldn't be anything other than a telephone. That's all it ever was, that's all it ever could do. Right? This is a computer that makes phone calls. This can do whatever you want. Anyone remember Apple's first slogan for the iPhone? There's an app for that. Whatever you want to do, you can download new functionality on this device in a way you never could in my old telephone because this is extensible. Now, that's pretty cool. That's why we like it. But it means some important things for security. It means it's kind of hard to test security because you don't know what it's going to be doing tomorrow. Right? Its functionality changes all the time. And it also means this can get malware on it. All right, so you all know that the Saudi government dropped malware on Jeff Bezos' phone. That was a feature upgrade. Right, it's a feature he didn't want, he didn't ask for, he didn't know about, but it's additional functionality delivered to his phone because it's extensible. Right, and this is why your refrigerator now sends spam. This is why your DVR joins a botnet because they are extensible. Fourth reason is complexity. So complexity is in a lot of ways the most, the biggest enemy of security. In complex systems, attackers have the advantage over defenders. A bunch of reasons for this. The obvious one is that a complex system has more code, right? more vulnerabilities, more bugs. But it also has more functionality and more avenues of attack. And there's a military principle called the position of the interior. And the idea is that the defender on the inside has to defend every possible attack, while the attacker can concentrate on one attack, can choose the time, place, nature of the attack. And complex systems just have more going on. It is easier to secure my home than this university building. I have fewer doors, fewer windows, fewer people, fewer things. It's just simpler. Internet's basically the most complex machine mankind has ever built. Kind of by a lot. Which makes it incredibly hard to secure. 
which gives defenders an enormous advantage. Fifth reason, there are new vulnerabilities in the interconnections. So as you connect things to each other, vulnerabilities in one thing affect other things. So 2016, th three years ago, and four years ago now, and remember the Dyne botnet? So this, these were vulnerabilities, internet connected, DVRs and webcams, allowed hacker, a hacker to create a giant botnet, which he used to attack a domain name service, which in turn caused about 25 popular websites to fall off the internet. It was a cascade of effects. 2013, remember the Target hack? One of the first big commercial hacks that made the news. I think the important lesson there is do not name your company Target. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. All right. The attackers broke into the company's payments network through a vulnerability in the HVAC contractor for several mid-Pennsylvania stores. Last year, there was a, an attack on a casino in Las Vegas. The articles never published the name of the casino, but they were attacked through a vulnerability in, and I'm not making this up, their internet-connected fish tank. And vulnerabilities like this can often be hard to fix because no one system might be at fault. I kind of collect stories of two systems that are secure that when come together create insecurities. And then my favorite example, a few years ago there was a vulnerability where you can get free Netflix. And the problem was that, I don't know if you know this, in Gmail the dots don't matter. So if in your Gmail address, you can add dots to your name and it's irrelevant. It all maps to the same address, right? Bruce Schneier at gmail.com is the exact same address as Bruce Dot Schneier or b.r.u.c, et cetera. Right? Google just strips the dots out before they, before they process the email address. So that means an infinite number of email addresses map to one email address. Netflix doesn't do that. And there was a way to sort of arbitrage those two ways companies dealt with email addresses to get free Netflix. Who's to blame there? Well, kind of nobody. They're perfectly, both perfectly valid ways of handling email. They're just different. And there are other attacks like that. And the more things you put together, the more likely we're going to see those. Sixth reason is that Attacks always get better, easier, and faster. Some of this is Moore's Law. Computers are faster. There might be a password that was good 10 years ago that's not good today. Not because we are smarter at password guessing. We're just faster at it. We can guess more millions of passwords per second. So we need a correspondingly more complex password to stay ahead of that attack. But attackers do get smarter. Attackers do adapt. Computer uh, security scientist Ross Anderson has the phrase of programming Satan's computer. Not Murphy's computer where things go wrong, Satan's computer where there's an intelligent, malicious adversary inside making sure anything that can go wrong does go wrong at the worst opportune time. Makes us different than like hurricane safety researchers. And we could have a whole conversation about, about hurricanes or tornadoes and how we would be secure against them. But we know that the tornado is never going to change what it does based on our security measures. But that happens all the time in computer security. So you see these little arms races. You might notice uh, every once in a while you get a lot of spam for a couple of days. Then it dies down again. It's because the spammers invented a new tactic. And it takes the anti-spam companies a little while to figure out what it is and how to detect it. And you see that in deep fakes versus deep fake detection, uh, ATM machine security versus ATM machine attacks. A lot of places you see these adaptive arms races. And expertise flows downhill. What today could be a top secret NSA security research program, tomorrow is someone's PhD thesis, the next day it's a criminal hacker tool. And it's important to realize because we often make decisions based on how hard something is. So the quintessential example of that I think is Stingray. I don't know if people heard of Stingray. Stingray, it's actually a product name, Harris Corporation. 
uh, makes a particular product called Stingray, and it is an IMSI catcher. Basically, it's a fake cell phone tower. And it works simply because these are surprisingly promiscuous. If anybody broadcasts, I'm a cell phone tower, my phone, all your phones will say, great, you're a cell phone tower. Here's my ID information. Send me phone calls, send me text, I'm right here. There is no authentication in that protocol. Because back in the 90s when it was developed, it was believed to be very expensive and a ridiculous attack for someone to put up a fake cell phone tower. And for a few years it was. And then companies started selling fake cell phone towers to governments. It was actually a very big secret in the FBI that they were using it without a warrant. That's another story. I mean, they would uh, drop prosecutions if evidence that's of Stingray's use would appear in court. It was that secret. Turns out it actually wasn't that secret. In 2014, Vice Motherboard uh, did an article where they uh, uh, built a detector. You could detect fake cell phone towers. Dra drove it around DC, found dozens of them around government buildings, foreign embassies, run by we have no idea who. Right, right, uh, right now, you can, uh, you can buy an IMSI catcher if you want one. Alibaba.com sells them, about $800. They are used in China to send SMS spam. You have a software-defined radio card, you can make one for free out of your computer. Right, so a decision made because it was expensive to attack the authentication between the device and the tower, it became cheap and suddenly we are all now living with common criminals using uh, IMSI catchers. So none of this is new. None of these lessons are, are, are new. But what's changing is how computers are going to be used. And, and I sort of argue that uh, it's all been a manageable problem up to now, but things are changing. And the thing that is changing is automation, autonomy, and physical agency. Computers directly affecting the world in a physical manner. So traditionally in computer security, we're concerned with company energy. I'll say it this way. There's something called the CIA triad. It's not that CIA, it's a different CIA. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are the three properties that we're expected to provide. Confidentiality, keep your, keep your data private. Availability, make sure you can get at it when you need it. Integrity, make sure no one is dinked with it. Most of the time, we're concerned with the confidentiality. When there is a data security story in the news, it is almost certainly about confidentiality. Privacy, data theft, data mis misuse. So the Equifax hack, the Target hack, the OPM hack, Jeff Bezos's phone, Cambridge Analytica. It's all about someone got access to the data who shouldn't have. The threats come in many forms. There are availability attacks. When you hear about DDoS attacks, when you hear about ransomware, those are both availability attacks. No one stole the data. We just can't get at it. Right? The city of Atlanta can't get at any of its data. It's a ransomware attack, it's an availability attack. There are integrity attacks. Right? You're a bank, you're worried about someone manipulating bank balances. Even if they don't take anything. Even if they do it randomly. But today, the integrity and availability attacks are much worse than the confidentiality attacks. When you get computers that affect the world in a direct physical manner, those are the attacks you care about because the effects are greater, because there's real risk to life and property. And so I'm concerned if someone hacks a hospital and steals my private patient medical records. I don't want that. But I'm really alarmed if they change my blood type. Right? That is a data integrity attack. Right? And I don't want them hacking my car, turning on the Bluetooth microphone, eavesdropping on my conversations. But I really don't want them disabling the brakes. That is a data availability attack. So cars, medical devices, drones, weapon systems, I don't know, thermostats, power plants, smart city, anything. Right? There's a fundamental difference between your spreadsheet crashes and you lose your data and your embedded heart defibrillator crashes and you lose your life. 
And it could be the exact same CPU, the exact same operating system, the exact same application software, vulnerability, attack tool, attack. The only difference is what the computer is doing and what it's attached to. That changes everything, even though nothing has changed. And that leads me to a seventh lesson. Because these trends become more critical as these systems become more critical. And the seventh lesson is this, that computers fail differently. So we all know how like normal things fail in our world. Uh, think of cars. Cars have parts. Parts break. They have, I don't know, mean time between failures. I'm not a, not a car engineer. And you could probably calculate how likely it is cars in our society break. And there's this whole ecosystem of auto repair shops in your community, my community, that deal with this steady state of cars that need repairing based on all the calculations we did. We're good at that. Computers don't fail that way. Computers all work perfectly until one day when none of them do. So I'll give you one example. Uh, there's a company that makes keyless entry systems for hotel rooms called Omidy. And you've all probably seen these in hotels. You get a key card, you wave it in front of a reader and the door opens. Right? Some near field uh, protocol. There was a vulnerability, I think in 2017, where I think all of the Omidy locks were vulnerable. Like every one of them around the world. Millions of them. Now, you think if you're a hotel, you actually have a protocol for your lock doesn't work. You probably got a locksmith on call, he's 20 minutes away. He drives there with his tools and he rehangs the door or fixes the latch, does whatever he needs to do. There is no protocol at the hotel for all 500 rooms in our hotel are broken and now need to be fixed. I mean, they work, but they're insecure. And the way you fixed them was you had to manually go to each hotel room door and flash the ROMs, which means basically it never happened. Most hotel chains just live with a vulnerability because they don't have the capacity to fix it. So at the same time all of this is happening, uh, there are some long-standing security assumptions that are failing. I'm going to talk about three of them. The first one is patching. Remember I said that software is lousy? The way we get security, actually there are two ways we get security today. One. A team of engineers, security engineers at Apple, uh, Apple and Microsoft and Google that designed them to be as secure as they can in the first place. And two, those same engineers are on staff to quickly write and push down patches when new vulnerabilities are discovered. And that works. Right? There's a steady stream of patches that go to your operating system and your phone. And you get nagged to install them. And by the way, the one from Microsoft from last month if I'm actually a few weeks ago in January, really critical, you should be installing it. Right? Apple just is like, we have an update for you, do you want to install it? You sure? I'll do it for you. Okay, I'll do it for you when you sleep, just push this button. All right, okay, push this button and I won't do it when you sleep. Damn it, I'm doing it now, I don't care. Right? <laughs> because that's how we get secure these devices. So that doesn't work for low cost embedded systems like DVRs and home routers. Uh, they're built uh, offshore, lower profit margin by third parties, ad hoc teams come together, write the software and disperse. They don't have security teams associated with a lot of these devices to write security patches. They're just not there. Even worse, a lot of the devices have no way to patch them. I mean, right now, the way you patch your home router is you throw it away and buy a new one. That's the mechanism, we don't have another. And actually, it's not a bad mechanism, environmentally disastrous, but for security, it's pretty good. And we also get security from the fact that you, th you get a new iPhone every you know, few years. And each one you get has more security features. That doesn't work for embedded systems. You, know, you replace your DVR, what, every five to 10 years? Your refrigerator every 25 years? I bought a new thermostat two years ago and I expect to replace it approximately never. And we don't know how to do that, especially if they don't get updates. Or think of a car, right? You buy a car, let's say, I'm gonna make this up, say software's two years old, 
You buy it, drive for 10 years, you sell it, somebody else buys it, they drive for 10 years, they sell it, probably at this point it's put in a boat, sent somewhere in Latin America, or someone else buys it, drives another 10 to 20 years. All right, go home. Find a computer from 1978. Try to boot it up. Try to run it. Try to make it secure. We haven't the faintest clue how to secure 40-year-old consumer anything. There's a reason Microsoft, Apple, Google depreciate old operating systems after like three revs. It is hard to maintain the old stuff. Do I expect GM to maintain a security test bed of, I don't know, 20 models times 40 model years? I don't know, we've never done that before. This is gonna be hard. Second thing that's starting to fail is authentication. And authentication kind of only just barely ever worked. Right? Human, mem human memorizable passwords aren't good for lots of applications. Two factor is great, but doesn't work in some situations. Backup authentication is terrible. The thing about authentication is that it's about to explode exponentially. So when you authenticate, it's either one of two things, and I will demonstrate them both. You either authenticate to a device, and just logged into my phone with my, my thumb, or you authenticate to a remote service. I just checked my email. And wait, those both work. You saw let me do them pretty quick. The thing you didn't see, the thing that's going to start dominating, is thing-to-thing -thing authentication. Right? This is just either me to a device or me to a service. But it's going to be devices to devices. And if you think about it, we don't know how to do that at scale. If you have, I don't know, 100 IoT devices around your person, that's 10,000 authentications, right, pairwise, 5,000, same thing. When you have 1,000 devices, that's half a million authentications. We don't know how to do that. Or imagine uh, some kind of driverless car or computer-assisted car. It will have to authenticate in real time, ad hoc, to thousands of other cars and road signs and traffic signals and emergency alerts and police broadcasts anywhere in the world. We don't know how to do that. We can do a little bit of it. I mean, right now, when I step into my car, this device automatically authenticates to the car and uses the microphone and speakers. If you have a car, you probably have that too. That's Bluetooth. And that works great, but if you remember, I was there to manually pair the devices. And I'll do that for 10 things, maybe 25 things. I'm not doing it for 10,000 things. I'm not doing it for half a million things. And if you have an IoT anything, you probably can control it through an app on your phone. And that'll also work for 10 things or 25 things, but not for thousands of things. And we don't have a better answer yet. The third thing that's failing is supply chain, which I maintain is actually insurmountably hard. So, in the news is uh, supply chain in China. So just like earlier this week, the U.S. Department of the Interior uh, grounded all non-emergency drones out of fear that it's Chinese software and it's not to be trusted. Uh, you'll hear the story about Huawei and 5G networking equipment. Uh, a couple of years ago, the story is about Kaspersky. Right, can you trust a Russian antivirus product? And the basic question is this, can you trust a computer that comes from a country whose government you don't trust? Perfectly reasonable question. It's not just the US. Uh, in 24, 2014, China banned, banned Kaspersky. Uh, 2017, India banned a bunch of Chinese uh, smartphone apps. In 1997, there was a debate in my community about Checkpoint. Should the US trust an Israeli security company? And in 2006, uh, ISIS wrote a program called Mujahideen Secrets because, of course, you can't trust Western encryption programs. You know, it's a hard problem, but it's just the beginning of the problem. Right? This is made by Apple, but it's not made in the U.S. Its chips are not made in the U.S. Its programmers carry over 100 different passports. Any one of those can subvert the security of this device. You know, we found back doors in Juniper firewalls and D-Link routers. Those are American companies. 2003, there was a really subtle backdoor that almost just barely did not make it into Linux. 
we got lucky there. We don't know the others we didn't get lucky. You know, and there's more. You have to trust the distribution mechanism. We regularly find fake apps in the Google Play Store. You have to trust the update mechanism. NotPetyo was distributed through a malicious update in a popular Ukrainian accounting software package. You have to trust the shipping mechanism. There's a Snowden document that showed NSA employees uh, opening and adding a backdoor to a, uh, to a Cisco box uh, that was headed for the Syrian telephone company. I saw a paper a few years ago, you can hack one of these iPhones through a malicious replacement screen. You know, you can't trust anyone, yet you have to trust everyone. And we have no good answer for this. I can, we, can, we can build a US-only iPhone, it'll cost 10 times as much, no one's gonna buy it. Our industry is deeply, deeply international. And there's no obvious way to fix it. So kind of a perfect storm here, right? Security is failing just as everything is becoming connected. And we've been okay with this sort of freewheeling, unregulated tech space because basically it didn't matter. And now it does. So primarily this is a, uh, a policy problem and getting the policy right is critical. And law and tech have to work together. To me, this is the key lesson of Edward Snowden. We always knew that technology could subvert law. He showed us how law could subvert technology. And if both don't work, neither work. So my recent book talks about security policy in this regard. With the, the actually, I think, absolutely awesome title of Click Here to Kill Everybody. Really brings them in at airport bookstores. <laughs> and I spend the last third on how to fix this problem. And there's a lot of moving parts to this standards, regulations, liabilities, international treaties and agreements. I mean, nothing, nothing works on its own, and everything works kind of mediocrely together, sort of like all of our other problems in society. And I want to pull out uh, two principles, one policy and one tech. The policy principle is that defense must dominate. That basically, we have one world, one network, one answer. When the NSA was founded in the 1950s, they had a dual mission. And there were really two sides to the NSA. There was the attack Soviet and Warsaw Pact communications, like eavesdrop on them, and defend US and NATO communications from eavesdropping. And you were able to keep both of those missions in your organization because the two systems were different in every possible way. That's no longer true. We can no longer defend our stuff and attack their stuff because everyone uses the same stuff. We all use TCP IP and PDF files and iPhones and Microsoft Windows and SMS messaging. So you have to make this very real choice. Either everyone gets security or no one gets security or everyone gets to spy or no one gets to spy. Those are your options. Right? If you put a back door in an iPhone, you can spy on the bad guys and necessarily the bad guys can spy on you. If you secure the iPhone, you can't spy on the bad guys, but also necessarily the bad guys can't spy on you. You get to pick one. And that is a deep policy argument. I think that as these devices become more critical to our national security, defense must dominate. This is in the pocket of every president, congressperson, judge, police officer, CEO, nuclear power plant operator, election official. It's, it's way too dangerous. Same thing about the IMSI catchers. There were years when the FBI used the fact that there was no security in that uh, tower to a handset protocol to go after the bad guys. Now it's being used to go after us. Right? Either, either everyone gets it or nobody gets it. Bunch of other examples of this. So we either have to design for security or design for surveillance. And I maintain defense must dominate in this world of physically capable computers. Second principle, more technical, is that we need to build in resilience. That resilience is a property that we need to really make explicit 
in our system designs. Right? Assume insecurity and design systems that work anyway. And, it, and we sort of know some resilience, I'm not property, ways to get resilience. Defense in depth, compartmentalization, avoiding single points of failure, ways to fail safe, fail secure, removing functionality, deleting data, right? systems that monitor each other. And resilience is an interesting property that you can't actually like buy resilience like you might buy defense in depth. Resilience is an emergent property. And I think there's some real research here that rivals the internet itself. The internet was, was created to answer this research question. Can we build a reliable network out of unreliable components? I'm kind of asking a similar question. Can I build a secure network out of insecure components? It is not obvious to me that the answer is no. It's also not obvious the answer is yes. But it's something we need to figure out. Because more and more, our internet will be built out of insecure components. And more and more, the security of the internet will be vital to society. So the real questions are how to get from here to there. I think markets fundamentally can't solve this. Markets are short-term and profit-motivated. Right? They work at the expense of society. And they actually can't solve collective action problems. Government is the entity we use to solve problems like this. Government is how we act collectively as citizens as opposed to individually as consumers. All right, so of course there are going to be problems. I mean, when we can list them, it is really hard for governments to be proactive. In fact, governments are terrible at being proactive. We can talk about regulatory capture, that difference between safety and security, right? the difference between a static safety environment and an intelligent and adaptive human adversary in a security environment, right? and how to regulate uh, security in a fast-moving tech environment. You know, we don't have an agile ability in government the way we have in software. And there's a huge disadvantage. We also don't have uh, regulatory authorities with the same footprint as tech. We're learning that with Facebook. Right? Facebook is global, yet everybody that can regulate them is inside a national boundary. And that mismatch is turning out to be a problem. So the devil's in the details here. And I actually don't have a lot of them. But the alternative is not viable any longer. And the thing is, governments will get involved regardless because the risks are too great and the stakes are too high. Right? Governments are already involved in physical security, cars, planes, consumer goods. And the physical threats of the Internet of Things, I think, will spur them into action. You know, when I give this talk to that you know, kind of anti-government, pro-libertarian Silicon Valley crowd, Basically tell them, look, your choice is no longer between government involvement and no government involvement. Your choice is now between smart government involvement and stupid government involvement. And what you need to do is to get ahead of this, start thinking about it, both the pros and cons, so you're not surprised. So you're there with actual suggestions when the regulations come. And I think regulations will incent private industry there is this you know, canard, basically, that regulation would stifle innovation. You hear that threat all the time. I think it's pretty much never true. I can read about it, about restaurant sanitation codes, automobile safety, building safety. But there is no real evidence. And, and I think if we do this right, it spurs innovation. I have lots of security tech that doesn't get implemented because the financial incentives aren't there. Good regulation raises the cost of insecurity, which in turn creates a market for products that reduce insecurity. Right? So I want regulations that uh, regulate output, not methodology. And so Europe's moving in this direction. Right? The GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, came into force uh, last year has very strong privacy and security requirements and even stronger penalties. Right? Europe is pretty much the regulatory superpower on the planet right now. And they're the only ones who are willing to issue fines that aren't rounding errors in companies' legal bills. 
Uh, in the United States, uh, states are leading the way, specifically California, New York, and Massachusetts. California passed a uh, GDPR-like privacy law, came into force last year. A IoT security law came into force January of this year. It's not that great. I mean, specifies a few things, no default passwords, but it's something. New York's regulating cryptocurrencies. So you're seeing more action in, in the states. Federal level, you're seeing uh, work done at some of the agencies. FAA with aircraft, DOT, auto, DOT automobiles, FDA medical devices, Federal Trade Commission consumer goods. Uh, I think Congress will, will follow here. I mean, nothing motivates the U.S. Congress like fear. And I think if there is a disaster, you'll, you'll, they'll get spurred to action. This is where I always worry about that, you know, we must do something, that is something, therefore we must do it. I mean, that kind of thinking. So sort of being ready with what we want matters. I think the international considerations are really interesting here because software is, is right one cell everywhere. Right? So right now the car you buy in the United States is not the same car you buy in Mexico. Right? Environmental laws are different. The manufacturers tune their engines to the local environmental laws. But the Facebook that you get in the United States is exactly the same Facebook you get in Mexico because it is way easier for Facebook to have one system and deliver it worldwide. Right? This is why you in the United States keep seeing all these GDPR warnings. Right? This is why California right, passes this IoT security law that says no default passwords on IoT devices. A uh, company makes a thermostat, they need to change their software to have no default passwords, they do so. They're not gonna maintain two software builds, one for California, one for everybody else. You will benefit from California's law even if you never step foot in California, or know anybody who's from there. Because right? that's the way it works. I used to work for IBM. They made a decision, we will implement GDPR worldwide because it is easier for us to do that than to figure out who is an EU citizen. Right? It's just easier. We're just going to do it. And that is going to happen. So regulations in a large enough market affect the entire world. So... And again, I don't see any alternative. You know, I can't name a single industry in the past 150 years that improves safety or security without being forced to by the government. Cars, planes, pharmaceuticals, food production, medical devices, restaurants, consumer goods, workplace conditions, most recently financial products. Like the market rewards making things as insecure as possible, and then selling it. You want to increase safety and security, you need regulation. And there's no other way. And right now, one of the things I'm pushing is that technologists need to get involved in public policy. One of the reasons I like seeing these joint programs at universities, because we have this problem in our society that tech and policy are different. That is two separate worlds. You can go back to C.P. Snow writing in the 50s and read about this. And as internet security becomes everything security, internet security technology becomes more important to overall security policy. And all of the security policy issues will have strong technological components. And we will never get the policy right if the policymakers get the tech wrong. So watch the going dark debate, right now Apple versus FBI again. The vulnerability equities debate. How to secure voting machines. How to do driverless car security. Now, we actually had, last year, a senator in the United States at a, at a public hearing, televised national TV, ask Mark Zuckerberg, how does Facebook make money? One, he didn't know, and two, he didn't realize that was an idiotic question? And I guess three, there was no one on his staff to tell him? But this is the current state of tech policy in our country. And it's not tenable. And we have to fix this. I mean, technologists need to get involved in policy discussions, whether it's on congressional staffs, in federal agencies, at NGOs, 
part of the press, in law enforcement. Right? We need people there who can pull tech and policy together. Is this bigger than security? I think we can argue uh, that all of the major uh, policy problems of our century will be, will be, I guess, either caused by tech or solved by tech or both. And that if we don't have technologists in the policy discussions, we're not going to get policy. Right? Bad policy will happen to us. So I applaud what's happening here, where tech and policy are being uh, married together. I think it's important. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. I'm happy to wrangle. Okay. All right. We have about 20 minutes or so for questions. So if, if we're overwhelmed, we'll line up. But if you'd like to at the beginning, just feel free to raise your hand. So, so it just takes one. Once one of you asks a question, everyone else will. This, this, this is a herd mentality. I know how it works. So there we go. Thank you. We have a mobile mic. We had a mobile. We had a mobile mic once, but it might have been two years ago. Totally not mobile. Look at this. All right. Hi. Um, so thank you for your wonderful talk. Can you raise the mic? That's really not. Yes. <laughs> Don't do that to these people. We're not twelve here. There you go. <laughs> It's too <laughs> Can't win. Nice. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, so you said that security is an economic choice. So um, I was wondering how can we as an individual um, protect ourselves if, if there is a cost to protecting ourselves? I mean, the short answer is pay the cost. Uh, the longer answer is you can't. So uh, we, we're moving to a world where your data is no longer to your control. I mean, so 15 years ago, I tell you about securing your computer and using encryption and, and better authentication, but you know, your email is on Google's computers, your photographs on Flickr's computers, your documents are on, I don't know whose computers they are, let's say they're Microsoft's computers. Uh, your financial data is on everyone else's computers. And, and we're at the point now where we have no visibility or control or even influence on the security of these systems. And I can tell you it's stuff you can do, but it's largely around the edges. And as we move to this cloud model, especially this you know, surveillance, capitalism-driven cloud model, where you're not actually even the customer of, the, of these sites, you're, you're just the user, there's actually not a lot we can do. All right, so there was, uh, anyone heard about the Wawa hack? Right, so latest big uh, retail retailer hack in the news, like 50 million credit card, Numbers stolen, all financial information, uh, available for sale on Pastebin. You, you want to make credit card fraud, that's what you're going to buy. Now, how do you secure yourself against that? You can't. Right? Don't use a credit card. Don't have an email address. Don't have a cell phone. I mean, this is kind of moronic advice for living in the 20th century, 21st century, wherever we are. So we're, we're running out of, of individual tech countermeasures. And then we're moving into the world of, of pretty much only policy countermeasures. So there are things we can do, but they are more around the edges now because the real core problems are now out of our control. Not a great answer was we got. Thank you. Come on up. I'm sure you are really familiar with the uh, 84 Ken Thompson Trust in Trust. So my question would be, how do we keep check on the policymakers where they are the person decide like so, what right? to do. So, and we're learning that. We're learning right now, sort of in the United States, what happens when uh, basically policymakers break the rules, which turn out to be norms, and, 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 and what do we do about it? There's no good answer. You know, we, what we know about complex adaptive systems is that uh, we iterate, and that we need meta systems to keep uh, systems in check, and meta meta systems to keep those in check, and it's turtles all the way down. Uh, we know that mutually distrustful parties watching each other is good, right? So government and the corporate world and NGOs and the press, 
that that kind of everyone watching each other works. And we, we need to be more agile in how we build systems. There's no real answer here. I mean, any closed system is vulnerable. And with enough threats, uh, will will fall. So we, all we know is to sort of build in security that'll work for the next bit of time, 10 years, 20 years, and then be ready to, to have to redo. I think, I think that's the security lesson of, of the last century. I'm not convinced we can learn it for this century. Uh, Bruce, thanks for being here. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you know about uh, security of digital voting machines, um, how well you think they fared in the 2016, 2018 election, and uh, really do you think that we can trust vote counts from digital voting? So, uh, basically the answer is no. Uh, I mean, the, the, so we know how to vote. Uh, there are two things we need to secure voting, and this is actually not even in dispute. Anybody who does election security knows this. You need a voter verifiable paper ballot. Uh, I, li I live in Minnesota. We vote the right way, and it's optical scan voting. So you get a piece of paper, you fill in ovals like you did in third grade, and uh, the machine it is scanned by machine, so you have very quick tally, the paper drops into a box, it's available for recount. That's the way you vote. The second thing you need is something called a risk limiting audit. This is statistical, and this is every election is audited to the degree of how close the election is. Very close election is audited a lot, far elections audited a little bit, and the math is just done. You don't have to decide, no one declares a recount, you always do this. Those two things are how we, how we secure elections. Uh, we're not that great in the United States. So lots of states still use uh, computer voting machines, which are terrible. Uh, quickly, uh, you'll often be asked if you do this, why can I bank online but not vote online? The answer is, is easy and obvious, and that is anonymity. The anonymity of voting requires all this extra security. If there was no anonymity of voting, it would be easy to secure. Right, send your vote in, we'll tally it, and publish it all in the newspaper. I'm done. I've just secured elections. But it's not enough. If you, but if you add anonymity, that break between you're able to vote and what your vote is means you can't roll things back. You can't do most of your audits. So financial transactions are easy. They're all, they all have your names attached. Elections don't. Uh, that's voting machines. Election security is actually more than that. There's the... Uh, Re registration and enrollment process, who can vote? Those are under attack. Talk about the voting machines. There is the tallying process, which is surprisingly ad hoc and insecure, if you start looking at it. And then there's the reporting process. So those are the four pieces, and we're doing terribly. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, uh, the local school district uh, had a forum on technology last fall uh, where they rolled out all these anecdotal great examples of how they were using it. And uh, the, they use uh, Gmail for, the, for their email. And they went on and on about how, well, there, there are no ads to the children on this whatsoever. Um, but the, the point was brought up that, well, Google still has access to all of this data that the students are generating. And the, the tech people for the district that were in charge did not understand the problem with that. And I, this goes back to a policy issue, and the, the person who asked the question was just incredulous at this, uh, and, and tried to explain it further, to which, again, it was just, it was crickets. So how do you, what's a solution there? Or, or what is a, a plan of attack, I guess? Yeah, I don't know, right? So, so the basic problem is we need to educate the populace on a complex tech issue, right? But, but that's the problem you've just described. And I've got a lot of those problems not just in, in, my, in my field, and, and I don't know the answer. I mean, we, we do our best. I mean, right now, face recognition seems to be something that people are understanding, right? They understand, you know, you see it being used in Hong Kong against dissidents and protesters. So you see how this is, technology can be abused. And uh, I think three cities in the United States have banned the technology for police use, right? This is becoming an actual issue. So what's going on? It, it, it's it's visceral, it's salient, it's vivid, right? It's something people can understand. I think we have to figure out how to do policy without broad understanding. Because we're not gonna get it on, on climate change. You know, you know, we're not gonna, but we do that. You know, 
we are we are not you know doctors, and yet we have a pretty vigorous regulation of medical devices and pharmaceuticals in our country, and that seems to work pretty well. So we've, we've managed it. We just didn't manage it here. And so I don't have a, a good answer. Yes? So um, I took privacy law here um, at the law school at Maurer. Uh, I'm in the cybersecurity risk management program, so I also take classes in like network security and everything. So it's a great inter interdisciplinary program. Excellent. Um, my first, my first uh, grad school class was in, was in privacy law, and we learned about uh, the sectoral approach to um, privacy regulation, and the regulation in general. Uh, we have the FDA, um, we have all these three-letter uh, agencies, FTC, regulating different parts of the economy. Uh, in an age when everything is a computer, uh, do you see that this is really sustainable? And if not, do you think a new type of regulatory agency is needed to... Uh, properly regulate uh, devices? So I think this is a key problem. And if you hear what he said, he said, well, we tend to regulate in silos. Right? So these people regulate aircraft, these people regulate cars, these people regulate consumer goods, these people regulate you know, something else, medical devices. And that works great, right? These functional divisions make sense because they're gonna, you're gonna have different regulations for toys than for medical devices. You just will. But what happens when everything is a computer? What happens when all of those devices use a Raspberry Pi, right? use an Intel CPU, use the same operating system? Are we gonna have like the Department of Computing, which will subsume everything, or will we have, again, functional departments that are gonna do the, regulate the same thing? Right? You make a Raspberry Pi and now have 16 government agencies regulating your product. Right? So both of those don't make sense. I, I spent some time on my, in my book on this. I don't have an answer, but I, I, I suggested that possibly an ODNI model might make sense here. So the Director of National Intelligence is a horizontal organization that coordinates among all of the, our country's, I think, 16 intelligence agencies. The, the vertical ones still exist, but there's a horizontal overlay. And maybe a model like that makes sense. Because you certainly can imagine we need to regulate horizontally and we need to regulate vertically. So we don't have a good model. That was the best model I found. I'm hoping that people who are better at policy than I am will figure that out. So I just gave you like a thesis topic. <laughs> All right, let me know. I'll read, I'll read your draft. Hello, thank you for your talk. So I want to contextualize the story of computer security in the process of globalization. So when, when you view um, the, the term development uh, or technological de development, and we know well that development is uneven, that there is a center, especially when it comes to technology. You have technology spreading from uh, the, the global cities around the world, and it spreads out. The problem now is that it seems that um, the connection enabled by the internet is spreading faster than the uh, security infrastructure that can um, follow and patch um, these critical infrastructure. Now the problem is with um, using policy as a solution to this is that policy is also centered at, um, in the US in the West and it spreads out to other countries. Um, and it, it's always going to happen that whatever policy is enforcing here is going to take effect in the per periphery, maybe years, maybe decades later. Which means that I, I grew up in Thailand. Okay, I, I come from Thailand. I'm going back to Thailand after I graduate. This would mean that um, Thailand, especially in the un, uh, underdeveloped part, we always be doomed as long as we cannot catch up with the policy or the, the development. So what, how, how can we talk about security in, in the process of globalization without cursing uh, people in the periphery in perpetual doom of trying to catch up? All right, so I think we have to figure out how. So you, so you, you have a couple of aspects of that that you brought up. The fact that we tend to export right, liberal American right. libertarian values on the rest of the world. The right, United States is a world outlier on free speech laws. And ours is not normal, ours is abnormal, and it is the one we force on the world. And countries like Thailand, smaller countries, have no say 
in how these systems are built, how they're designed, how they're regulated, and they are the receivers of here, this is it, you got it? Right, your choice is to uh, use it or to not like it and use it, right? You, you can't even shut it off. And I, countries, I think, are rightly getting tired of that, that this sort of United States, California values being exported is not the right way to do it. The, the answer seems to be like just as bad, which is balkanization. Countries saying, well, we're going to just cut ourselves off. The only country that can probably get away with that is China. Right? You think even Russia is not going to be able to? India won't? I mean, the population aren't that big. The tech isn't there. I think we need to recognize that, that these, again, you know, one world, one network, one answer. And, and the notion that the market will produce the best answer necessarily advantages the wealthy markets and disadvantages the poorer markets. And you know, I think we, we deliberately need to find other governance vehicles than the market to solve this. So this is a problem I, I, that I'm seeing talked about more. I mean, not being addressed in the companies, not really being addressed in Western governments, but it, I, it's being talked about in ways I hadn't seen it even five years ago. So people are starting to see this a, as a problem. And hopefully we will come up with solutions. You know, right, world governance is hard. I mean, so you look at some of the, you know, the, the ITU, which the world, the governance of the phone system, it's kind of a mess. And you don't want the ITU in charge of your internet. I mean, it would be a freaking disaster. So now we have this sort of multi-stakeholder model, which is sort of the internet governance model. And that's becoming more international. So they're, they're, I, think, I think we're getting better. We have a long way to go. But you're really right to, to shine a light on the problem and even to say, hey, you know, here I am in a country that's not right, US, UK, or even you know, Western Europe. And you know, I'm, I'm getting the short end of this, and I'm having no say in it. I'm just getting received these things Right? Suddenly, Airbnb's in my city, and I didn't even ask for it. What the hell? So no answer, but yes, important problem. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Really enjoyed it. I am uh, very interested and engaged in policy work in several areas, and I think you articulated a really challenging issue in the compartmentalization of the regulatory structure, and that's just within the U.S. There is a model that may be helpful, certainly not the complete answer, but there are multiple U.S. agencies and departments that are involved with human subjects research. And to address that, there was adoption of what's called the common, uh, common rule for human subjects protection and in medical and other types of human subject research. And then the 15 or so agencies that are all affected by that type of policy uh, were signatories to that regulation. And it affects all of them, except for FDA, which is a little bit of an outlier. So that's not the complete answer, but it may provide some, some way, good ways of thinking about how to approach it. That's good. Uh, and I like it now. I mean, things that have worked in the past are likely to work again in the future. So that's good. Thank you for your talk. Um, so my question is twofold. First, looking uh, from a regulatory perspective, um, I feel like even the Department of Defense has a hard time establishing specific test and evaluation protocol, procedures, standardization uh, for, for you know, military weapons that, that go through this kind of... You don't um, want to know how insecure they are. You actually don't want to know. Well, I mean, but yeah, but really, don't though. Don't trust me. <laughs> and, and some of that, you know, might be in part due to um, a, a lack of established procedures, you know, for, for going through this rdt &E kind of phase. How then do you um, set benchmarks, you know, for any potential IoT device uh, from a regulatory perspective when, again, you know, even from the military side where you think we would have everything, uh, you know, Right. I mean, I mean, right. The answer is going to be the answer is way really too long to talk here. But I mean, sure. people are working on how do we figure out what a secure IoT device looks like, even in, in a model where the designer of the device doesn't give us the source code, doesn't give us access to the internals. Uh, right now, Consumer Reports, Consumers Union is working on on be able to test IoT devices for security with uh, with no uh, cooperation from the manufacturers. So we're working on this. It's hard. It's actually very hard. 
Again, unlike safety, where you just like, do the pajamas catch on fire? Yes, no. That's easy. Right? Because you know, fire's static. It's not changing. And, you know, will, will the kids' toys allow creepy stalkers to eavesdrop on them? Is much, much harder. And you know, this just in, a lot of kids' toys do allow creepy stalkers to uh, eavesdrop on them. So no answers, but we, we're working on this. And, and yes, it's a, it is a real hard problem. The, the second part of that, if I may, is how do you then convince those 16 different intel community agencies and departments to go along with this type of regulation when that's exactly what their missions, not only intelligence, but increasingly offensive cyber military related activities rely on? I mean, right, these are decisions made at a higher end, I mean, a higher level. I mean, the way you convince an intelligence agency to go along with what you do is you be the intelligence agency's boss. Right? That's the way you do it. This really isn't any other. It's like you are ordered to do this. They're like military people, right? You can tell them what to do. That's, that's the point. <laughs> so the decision, I mean, this is why, I mean, FBI is, is making a decision based on their very myopic view of law enforcement. Someone above them has to look at needs of law enforcement, needs of national security, and then adjudicate. So you convince them to go along by like firing them if they don't, I don't know. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to say we only have two minutes left, so we might do a quick lightning round. All right, two questions. The, uh, yes or no questions? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm, uh, I'm an open question kind of guy. Um, to your audience here, you, you've given us a call, call to action. You know, we need people who uh, are bilingual in technology and policy uh, to do something. Uh, can you suggest some things uh, to yes. folks like this? Uh, what to do? <laughs> <laughs> All right, please suggest some things. So I actually, I, I, I maintain a resources page in this, uh, publicinteresttech.com with hyphens, where I list I, I, what, what, everything I know in this area, every document written, every NGO, every academic program, ev you know, pretty much everything. So go there and, and look at the various ways you can get involved. Uh, so that, that's the first place I'd go. Uh, I, this is hard. I, I actually give talks on this. And we have a, you know, both a supply and demand problem. The supply problem is the big problem. I don't have enough like, techies who want to get involved in public policy. But I have immediate demand problem. There are no places for the techies to go to get involved in public policy. So we need to sort of build this whole ecosystem out. So everything I know about the ecosystem is in, in, on that web page. So I tell you to go there. Do you have like a most important thing that you would tell maybe like an incoming freshman to a college that they need to be aware of in security? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, fantastic. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah.